For the final learning objective, let's look at some approaches to solving wicket problems. This is a typical approach to rational problem solving and decision making that you're probably familiar with. You first identify the problem, explore information and create ideas, select the best idea, test it and then evaluate the results. The point of defining a particular problem as wicked is not to sit around and lament, but to point out that these problems require a different kind of response. Defining particular problems as wicked was a challenge to the dominant rational responses that we're familiar with based on the previous slide. Instead, responses to wicked problems need to be collaborative, innovative and flexible. Tackling wicked problems raises a range of skills and capability issues for people. The need to deal with the, socially, the, with the social complexity associated with wicked problems, such as working across organizational boundaries, engaging stakeholders and influencing citizens' behaviors, requires additional skills over and above the more traditional analytical, conceptual and project management skills often required. Critically, tackling wicked problems also calls for high levels of systems thinking. This big picture thinking helps people make the connections between the multiple causes and interdependencies of wicked problems that are necessary in order to avoid a narrow approach and the artificial taming of wicked problems. People and organizations and nation states also need to look for ways of developing of obt or obtaining this range of skills, including through the recruitment, contracting of labor and outsourcing particular analysis, formal learning programs and encouraging employees to undertake a relevant range of work to broaden their experience. A multidisciplinary approach is one practical way to garner all the required skills and knowledge for tackling any particular wicked problem. So take some time to look at these skills and identify where it is the gaps are in your own learning and how you might be able to develop some of these skills. For this subject, we are going to look at four approaches to addressing the complexity in wicked problems. Firstly, we'll look at divergent versus convergent thinking, a soft systems methodology, adaptive capacity, and building resilience. The first thing to recognize is how we see problems and how we think about their solutions. Diverging and converging are both natural forms of thinking. You do both of these things while problem solving, whether you notice it or not. When you have a question at hand, for example, what shall we do tonight? You make a list of options, such as dinner, movie, going to the footy, etc. Then you judge and select. Except that most people don't do it that way. Most people list and judge at the same time. Dinner, no. Movie, perhaps not. Convergent problems are those for which attempted solutions gradually converge on one solution or answer, while divergent problems are those for which different answers appear to increasingly contradict each other all the more they are elaborated. And this requires a different approach involving different faculties, often of a higher order, like empathy and emotional intelligence. Wicked problems therefore require us to first use divergent thinking and then convergent thinking. It obviously also requires a systems approach, innovation and experimentation of untested ideas and solutions. To further understand how using divergent thinking and systems thinking might be an approach to solving wicked problems, we look at the approach of soft systems methodology. The primary use of SSM is in the analysis of complex situations where there are divergent views about the definition of the problem or soft problems, such as how to improve health service delivery, how to manage disaster planning, 
When should mentally disordered offenders be diverted from custody, etc.? Developed by Peter Checkland, there are typically seven steps to soft systems methodology. Firstly, a, a situation needs to be considered problematic, and then it needs to be expressed, which is often where the issue lies with wicked problems. Following this, and going now below the line, we need to apply systems thinking about the real world in order to fix real world problems. So in step three, you identify the root cause of relevant systems and define those systems. And then you develop conceptual models of systems which you have originally described. Following this, you go back into comparing these to the models of the real world and identify in stage six what changes are required those that are systematically desirable, or in other words, the leverage points in the system and that are culturally feasible. Based on that, you action to improve the problem or the situation. Now, I realize that this is not enough detail for you to actually go out and perform a soft systems methodology. But however, the main point to draw from this is that you need to be able to apply your systems thinking about the real world in order to solve real world problems. Next, adaptive capacity is the capacity of a system to adapt the, to the environment where it exists and is changing. It's applied often to ecological systems and human social systems. When it's applied to human social systems, adaptive capacity is determined by the ability of institutions and networks to learn and store knowledge and experience. Creative flexibility in decision making and problem solving often requires the existence of power structures that are responsive and considered and requires the input of all the stakeholders. So what that basically means from a wicked problem point of view is that ecosystems, organizations, and these wicked problems require solutions that help the problem adapt over time to changing circumstances, such as the social inclusion strategy in poverty reduction, where you are enabling people and removing barriers for them to adapt. Building adaptive capacity then leads to resilience, which is the long-term capacity of a system to bounce back and deal with change and continue to develop. For an ecosystem such as a forest, this can involve dealing with storms, fires and pollution, while for a society resilience involves an ability to deal with political uncertainty or natural disasters in a way that is sustainable in the long term. Increased knowledge of how we can strengthen resilience in society and nature is becoming increasingly important in coping with the stresses caused by climate change and other environmental impacts. So how does a society rebound from floods? Or how do people adapt to any new changing circumstances in their environment over the long term? So all these questions are important in understanding how best to solve wicked problems and avoid the traps such as the poverty trap outlined earlier. Finally, to see if you can apply some of the content from this week's lecture, please read the news article from the BBC by clicking on the link. Once you have read the article, answer the question of why Australia's boat people issue is a wicked problem. Make sure you use the five criteria of a wicked problem from the lecture as a guide to answering the question. And remember, you will also find these materials on the LMS page under this topic. That's it for today's lecture. We look forward to seeing you in the seminar this week.